Since I was a kid, I've noticed the ice, I guess, quality. And I say quality because I'm, I'm an active participant in the whaling community here in Barrow, so quality of the ice is very important to us. Since I was a kid and, and to this point, the ice quality has degraded. It almost seems impossible that we can go out during the spring season and, and actually harvest whales. It's getting so bad. I've got two pieces of ice core here. On my left, this is a piece of multi-year sea ice. And on my right, this is a piece of first-year sea ice. And, and one of the main differences is the amount of salt that's still contained in each core. The first-year sea ice contains salt in, in small brine pockets. So it's actually in, in liquid form, dissolved still in the seawater. Whereas the multi-year ice core has gone through at least one summer. And in, in the summertime, the meltwater flushes out these brine pockets. We used to have, in the way that scientists put it, is it's called multi-year ice, but what we would call it is called uh, pekoliuk. And it's actually where we go to get freshwater ice, believe it or not, on the ocean. There used to be a lot more of it. And I can remember it growing up, there would just be fields of this stuff. And anymore, I haven't come across it in a number of years. All of the ice that is formed and is right off of shore now that we are actively whaling off of or will be within the next couple of weeks is all first year ice. When previously it would be multi-year ice, which is a lot thicker, can support a lot bigger whale, and is also just inherently a lot safer to be on because of the thickness, it's grounded. These last few years, because the ice hasn't been grounded, I think there have been a couple of occasions where crews have been stranded out on a piece of ice because it released from what we thought to be grounded sea ice. And all of a sudden there's water between you and land and, and you're in a lot of trouble. The ice itself is a lot stronger. And so multi-year sea ice, it would be harder to drive an icebreaker through it. But at the same time, it could support more weight if you want to land an aircraft on it. Or again, for the locals around here, if you want to pull a whale up out of the water and you want to pull it up onto the ice, this type of ice, the Kuliak, the multi-year sea ice, that can take a lot more weight. The reason why ice thickness is important is because it establishes your limits for maybe how big of a whale that you can actually catch. If you have three feet of ice, you probably don't want to go trying to catch a 50-foot bowhead whale because you're not going to get it up on the ice and you're not going to get it butchered in time. But if you have three feet of ice, you might be able to get a 24-foot whale and get it up. That type of information is very important. Okay. Ah. So I put it on my boot because I don't want to. I don't want to get snow on the bottom of the sample because then it. If we're measuring salinity, we can come in sample. That's so close to being the whole core. There's just a little bit of ice left in the hole, I think. Andy's group, they have that Barrow Sea Ice Radar. We use that for work every day and, and throughout the whaling season. We'll, we'll just look at it and at least coming into work when there's no lead, we'll, we'll turn on the Barrow Sea Ice Radar and see if it's moving or if it did open up. And then usually I lose all my staff because they all want to go whaling. <laughs> when the ocean is first freezing over, you've got this kind of soup of ice crystals in the, yep. the upper part of the ocean. They, they float to the surface and they congeal and they form this granular. There's lots of bubbles and inclusions in this layer. Once this solidifies, it kind of caps the ocean. You get less wind influence, less waves. You have a much quieter regime underneath the ice. The rejection of salt from between the ice crystals creates a constitutionally supercooled layer underneath the ice. So any crystal that's vertically oriented and sticking down into that layer grows faster than the rest. When we're just sitting there, is, is changes in, in the weather. Wind, um, you, you watch the ice as it's floating by and you're watching what direction it's going. And it kind of tells you which way the current's going. If you have a west wind, you know that the ice is eventually gonna come back in. So you're not gonna be able to stay out very long. If you have an east wind and it's, and it's very strong and you're on the lead, but the wind is blowing 25, it's probably not safe to be right on the edge because that stuff may 
or may not break off. Can you see this feature here? If you come over my side. Yeah. So this is a, is a dendritic brine drainage channel. As the ice is expelling the salt from it, as the ice cools down and brine volume decreases and the pores constrict, you get explosion of brine within the ice and that is what's happening here. This is a channel that's formed. You can see all these like branches feed into one main channel. And so that channel then more or less terminates here at this fraddle layer. Yeah. And there's actually some indication it carries on, which is pretty interesting. From a biota point of view, that's important because that's how they're going to exchange nutrients with the ice underneath. From an oil percolation point of view, that's clearly not a barrier to percolation. Oil could migrate all the way up through that. When we're out whaling and we're, we're utilizing the skinned boats, we're sitting there on the ice edge. And you try to pick spots through experience you know that they surface around. Sometimes it's what we call a kangechluk, where the ice edge is kind of like a half moon type shape. Or you go up to uh, Nuvuluk where you're on a point where they'll pass the point and they'll usually surface close to that and go. A lot of it is chance. A lot of it is, is experience and, and kind of knowing where to set up your boat based on the different ice conditions. Things happen, ice moves in ways that we don't understand. And we actually have been active in involving local experts getting their understanding. They're the people who are going out this time of year, not always rescuing people. Sometimes they're out hunting in these conditions. And they have their ideas about how the ice and the currents interact and, and what makes the ice move. And so we, we have a very integrated system of observations with you know technological moorings and, and radars, but also very fundamental knowledge from people out there living their lives among the sea ice. A lot of times when people come and talk to me and, you know, you go whaling, that's so awesome. You know, they're, they're really excited. And to me, I get excited about whaling, but it's, it's, it's just what I do. But there's something about sitting there next to an open lead with a little bit of wind blowing. Everybody's completely quiet for the most part. It's a real spiritual connection when you're just sitting there and you're waiting. And there's absolutely nothing else going on but that. That is, that is the goal. You sit there and you be quiet and you wait. And it, it sounds really boring, and it might be boring to some people, but it's, it's, the, it's one of the greatest joys to me.